we're making the nutcracker body out of a piece of this three inch by three inch hard maple. The first thing we want to do with this is measure and mark. I already did this off camera days ago because I have been batching these out for Christmas presents. But basically what you want to do is you want to find the center of your piece of stock. So this is a three inch by three inch square. So one and a half inches is center on the face here. You want to draw a pencil line that's going to be at least the length of your blank. And you, you want your blank to be about four and a half inches. Now you can be a little more conservative with the length. Um, this is, was originally a 36 inch piece of stock. And had I been more conservative, I probably could have gotten eight nutcracker bodies out of this one piece of 36 inch long stock. This will be the seventh piece. I don't have enough room here to make another one. Doesn't matter anyway, it's got a big crack on the end here. So, but if you have a good piece of uh, stock to use, 36 inches long, if you make your measurements slightly more conservative than mine, you probably can eke out eight out of one piece of stock. But as it is, this one's four and a half inches in length. I have marked down here where I want to leave myself some room to square up the ends on the lathe uh, when it's between centers. And also this is where I'm going to make the tenon for my chuck. This indicates where I'm going to round off the bottom of the body of the nutcracker before I part it off. So you want to give yourself some room there. And I think that's about, that's about half an inch. So I have about five eighths here from the end end. That's where my tenon is going to be. So it depends on if your stock's really nice and flat and square, you could probably get away with a half inch here and that'll add up um, over however many that you can make. Probably get eight out of a piece, um, I'm thinking. But uh, do the math. <laughs> uh, this is a half inch for the round over the bottom of the body and parting it off. And this mark indicates where we're going to be drilling our hole for the nut cavity. I use a one and three quarter inch bit that seems to be about the right size for even the largest walnuts. So you could probably get away with a smaller bit if that's all you have, but you could always come in here with like a scraper or a little carbide hollower and make this as wide as you want it to be. But this is just a reference mark for me for when I drill my hole for the, the nut cavity. And this marks our length, obviously. Okay, so we're going to find center on each end of the blank. I'm just using a plastic center finder here and a pencil. And I tend to run my center finder around all four corners because that way, if your blank's not a perfect square, you end up with these crosshairs. And that tells you the middle of that crosshair is where your perfect center is. So just do the other side the same way. Go into all four corners. All right. Okay, so this one's definitely not a perfect square. We have crosshairs right there. So what we do is we take our punch right in the middle of those crosshairs and we make a divot. Same thing on the other side. All right. What I like to do is I like to drive my drive spur in with a wood mallet until you can pick up the blank like that. All right, so before we proceed on to the next step, I just want to make a quick note here. This is not the same piece of wood. <laughs> uh, the maple blank I showed at the beginning didn't make it. Uh, as I was turning it, I got vibration, I got a catch, I stopped the lathe, see what was going on, and there was a crack. So I decided to just start with a new piece of wood so this is a piece of cherry. It's from a tree that fell in my mom's yard uh, a couple years ago. It's a little bigger than what we need, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to turn a tenon on this end. That's going to allow us to put it in the chuck, and we're going to drill a hole for the threaded rod.
All right, so we're just about ready to drill, but before we do that, I wanted to mention a few things. Uh, the first thing is I took a compass and using the divot that I made for our drill bit that's going to drill the hole for the nuts, I drew a circle to represent that hole. And the reason for that is because we want a reference to how far to drill through with our bit uh, for the threaded hole. So we want to make sure that we drill at least past the top of the opening here. That way when we drill this cavity, the hole for the threaded rod is already there. The other thing I wanted to mention was I am starting the hole on the end here with a one and a half inch Forstner bit. We're not drilling a hole to thread in the end grain for the threaded rod. End grain doesn't hold threads very well. We're going to drill this one and a half inch hole so far down because we're going to turn a face grain plug or an insert that we're going to then drill and tap for the threaded rod because face grain holds threads a lot better especially in something that's going to see a lot of use a lot of threading and unthreading so the other thing too with the inch and a half Forstner bit is that it gives some clearance for my Jacobs chuck because the inch and an eighth bit that I use to drill the hole for the threaded rod does not go all the way uh, or doesn't go as deep as I need it to uh, Jacobs chuck hits the end of the blank so this gives me some relief here so that I can drill the hole as deep as I need it to go. All right, let's get started with that. Okay, so I've removed the nutcracker blank from the chuck. I have my glue block on the lathe. The next step is to glue this to the glue block so that we can drill the cavity for the nuts. We're going to be using hot glue and we're going to be using our tailstock and our live center here in this divot that we made earlier to center where the hole for our nuts is going to be. So we're not centering the blank on the glue block we're centering where the hole is going to be drilled and that's why we made that divot and that's what we're going to use as a reference point so we're going to bring the tail stock up lock it down and we're going to hold the blank against the glue block and slowly advance the quill until the point of the live center engages in that divot once it does we put some pressure on there all right you want to check it and make sure it's not going to spin just with the pressure of your hand. So make sure it's locked tight. Lock your tail stock down. And then we're going to take our hot glue gun and we're going to run a bead of hot glue along the back side of this blank. And we want to make sure that we get good adhesion. So we want to run a nice even bead all the way along the back and down the side here. You don't need to dump a ton of glue onto this. This will actually hold very securely once the glue sets up. But you do want to make sure you get an even bead all the way around. So take your time and make sure you get a nice, consistent, heavy bead across there. And then kind of overlap where you started, and that's it. All right, so my glue's set up. I'm ready to drill the cavity for the nuts, but before I do that, I want to know how deep to drill the hole. So I'm going to use this depth gauge, and I'm going to make some reference marks here to go by. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reference the depth gauge off of this side of the blank. I've already extended it to the other side of this hole. So we have our 1 and 8 inch hole here that we drilled for the threaded rod. We want to make sure the cavity for the nuts extends past that slightly so that the threaded rod can go all the way into the cavity to crack the nuts. We have the inch, the 1 and a half inch hole that we drilled. So I'm using that 
as my initial reference point. That gets me past the one and eighth inch hole. So I can come up here to the side of my blank, I make a mark. I've already marked it, but I'm gonna make a mark here. And I see I have probably about three quarters of an inch or so from the edge here. Now, I don't wanna drill to that mark because for one thing, we're gonna be turning this to round and shaping it. So we're gonna lose a lot of material here. We wanna make sure that we don't uh, start turning into the hole we drilled. Also, on your Forstner bits, you have this little pilot spur, and that's gonna leave an indent in the back of this hole. I don't like to leave those. It leaves a little divot in there. I'm gonna take a scraper and make that nice and flat and smooth on the back of this hole. So we wanna stop shy of our final drilling depth. So I'm going to, and I've already done this here, I'm gonna come back about a quarter inch or so and make a mark, and then I'm gonna set my depth gauge to that mark. And that way I can check my depth as I'm drilling, just make sure I don't go too far. The other thing you can do, since we already have this hole here, is we can check our progress as we're drilling, make sure we don't drill too far. So you can drill a little bit, stop the lathe, check, drill a little bit, stop the lathe, and check. The other thing to keep in mind, when you're drilling with a hole like this going through, you're going to encounter vibration. So just take your time, go slow, keep your lathe speed low. Also be aware this is off balance because it's centered on our drilling mark, not on the center of the blank. So it's going to be off balance as it's spinning around. You have sharp corners and sharp edges spinning around. So be aware of where your hands are when you're drilling. Stay on this side of the blank, on the tailstock side of the blank. Do not try to stop it from spinning when you turn off the lathe by grabbing this. Let it stop on its own and just be aware of where your hands and your arms are at all times while this is spinning around. All right, let's get started drilling. To scrape the back side of this hole to get rid of the divot left from the Forstner bit and uh, just complete that in there. We got a little bit of a ledge left from the bit too so we want to kind of try to make a transition so that there's nice smooth transition between the walls and the back of the hole. So I'm just going to use this uh, square carbide scraper here. Um, you can buy these easy wood tools. There's a bunch of knockoff brands or you can just make your own like I have here. So let's get the scraping done. So I scraped the back of the hole, I got it nice and flat back there, I got a nice smooth transition um, from the back of the hole to the side of it. I scraped to about my mark, maybe just a hair past it, but I think there's still plenty of wood here for when I turn it around and uh, shape it. I got enough uh, material there, I won't get into the hole. So the only thing I want to do before I take it off the glue block is I'm going to take my bowl gouge and I'm going to chamfer this hole in just a little bit so that when I put it between centers or put it back on a chuck to turn it around, it's less likely my gouge is going to catch on the edges of this hole and tear out uh, chunks of 
grain and stuff. It's not completely necessary, but I find it helps uh, make a smoother transition when you're turning this around. Alright, so it's off the glue block and it's back on the chuck. The next step is to continue drilling this one and a half inch hole that we started drilling earlier. Now the reason I don't drill all the way through at the beginning with the one and a half inch forcer bit is because I don't want an opening that large at the top of this cavity here. We drilled down with the one and an eighth inch bit and I like that size hole because it gives a nice finished look uh, in my opinion. The other reason is because I only want to drill down a certain amount with the one and a half inch Forstner bit because I want to leave a ledge here. So I want my one and eighth inch hole and then about a quarter of an inch above that is where the one and a half inch hole is going to stop. So that gives me a nice flat surface to register my face grain plug against when I put it in there. The other thing I wanted to point out was I didn't sand this after I drilled and scraped this hole. And the reason for that is because I'm going to wet sand this with walnut oil once it's completely turned down to size. It's very dangerous to try to sand this when it's spinning in either orientation, especially though when it was on the glue block with this hole facing the tailstock. You have a hole here that's perpendicular to this opening. So you have sharp edges from the hole in here and you have a catch potential with your fingers and the sandpaper. It's very dangerous. Not only that, but you have these sharp corners and you have these sharp edges whipping towards you. It's very easy to catch your hand. It's very easy to catch the sandpaper in your fingers in there. It's just not a good idea. So the best thing to do is wait until you've completely finished turning it, then wet sand it all down with walnut oil. If you have a good sharp drill bit and you take your time and then you come back in here with a scraper and clean this up a little bit, you're not going to have a lot of sanding to do anyway. So it's just better and safer to sand it with the lathe off and do it by hand. All right, let's get started, finish, or let's get finished started. Let's start finishing <laughs> that hole. <laughs> All right, so in my chuck right now, I have my face grain plug mounted. In essence, I turned this off camera. I turned several of these nutcrackers for Christmas, and I went ahead and just had some face grain plugs already turned ready to go. So this one was already made. Basically all it is, it's just a piece of cherry I face turned. I took a piece of wood like this, and you want to use like maple, cherry, a good hard wood. You want it to uh, hold threads well. So. I mounted my piece of cherry between centers with my face grain facing the tailstock perpendicular to the lathe bed, just like you would a bowl blank. I mount it between centers, I turn a tenon on the end so I can mount it in the chuck, and then using my calipers and a parting tool, I get my diameter to one and a half inch, which is the same size as the hole that I drilled in the top of the nutcracker, and then I work that the whole length of this plug. I make the plug longer than the hole in the nutcracker because I want to make sure this bottoms out against that ledge. But before I glue it into the nutcracker body, I want to go ahead and drill the hole for my threaded rod. And the reason why I'm doing it now instead of after it's in the nutcracker is because when it's in the nutcracker, this will be flipped the other way. So the drill bit will be drilling through the back side of this plug. When it exits this face of the plug, it's going to break away that grain. You're going to have tear out. We're going to have a rough, jagged edge surface there. We don't want that. So we're going to go ahead and drill from the bottom, basically, of the plug with a 7 8 inch Forstner bit. And then when we glue it into the nutcracker and the glue dries and we part off the top here, our hole is already there and it's ready to tap.
I just want to point out too, when you're drilling this, you don't want to drill all the way through the back. You don't want to drill into your chuck. So I stopped, checked the depth, and I stopped drilling my hole about to where I'm probably going to part it off when it's on the nutcracker. All right, so I just wanted to talk about the ledge that I keep referring to in case anybody was confused by that. Okay, so here is the cavity where the nuts will go into to be cracked. This is the hole through which the threaded rod will enter to crack the nuts. This is the ledge. Okay, so here's our one and one eighth inch hole that the threaded rod will come through. This is the ledge that our face grain plug will seat against. All right, so if I put the plug in, you can see it seats against that ledge, and that's where our uh, threaded rod will come down through. So we don't need a ton of glue here. I'm just going to cover the surface of the plug very well, all the way around it. Um, this is where you, you don't really want a ton of squeeze out because it's going to run down into the cavity of the nutcracker and you're just going to have to clean it up later or sand it, which is with these is kind of a pain because it's hard to get in that cavity and scrape or clean out the wood glue. I'm going to put just a little bit on the edge of this. We don't really need a lot here. You probably really don't even need that there, but I'm going to go ahead and put some there anyway. So when it seats against that ledge, it gets glued. So I've got plenty of glue on my plug. I'm just going to start sliding it in to the hole here. I'm just going to kind of twist it a little bit to kind of help spread that glue in there. I'm going to pull up my tailstock. And I'm going to use my live center. I right, still have my center hole for where I turn my face screen. And I'm just going to let that and just push that into place. Because I do have a pretty snug fit in there. Alright, so the plug is glued in place. I pressed it in with the tailstock until it seated against my ledge here. And now I'm just going to let it set up overnight with some pressure on it and then turn it in the morning. Alright, so it's been well over 24 hours since I glued this up. It's ready to turn. I'm just going to cut this plug off with a flush cut saw. And then I'm going to put a chamfer in there with my bowl gouge and pull my tailstock back up and start turning this to size and shape. All right, so we're ready to start turning this down to size and shape.
So I'm ready to start wet sanding here. Like I said before, I'm going to use uh, food grade walnut oil. You could use mineral oil if you want to with beeswax, whatever, as long as it's uh, food safe oil. I'm going to sand this by hand with the lathe off. I will not be running the lathe while I sand this. I'm going to just sand with the grain, all right, like you would any other spindle turning. And I'm going to sand around my opening here, soften this edge right here. It's kind of sharp and a little ragged from turning. So we want to try to do that, and it's just basically straightforward. We're just going to sand from 150 up to 600. All right, let's get started with that.
right, so I was just getting finished up here with uh, 600 grit. All I've been doing is going from 150 up to 600. I'm making sure my sandpaper and the nutcracker is good and saturated with walnut oil. And I just sand with the grain. You want to make sure you remove any tool marks, any little scratches or gouges that you may have created while you was turning it. What I like to do is down here on the bottom where I have a curve that's kind of usually hard to sand this way. I like to lay the sandpaper out, have both thumbs down, and just work it from the bottom up to the top. That maintains your curves nice and it helps you get rid of these little transition lines that you might, may have created while you were turning it. Like sometimes here where I'm turning down to the bottom, sometimes I'll have a transition line where I'm continuing this curve to the bottom of the nutcracker. So it'll be like a little bit of a line or a ledge right there and I like to make sure I get that sanded all the way out. I even sanded now I did not sand inside the hole here. Don't sand this hole. We're going to tap it later. We want it to maintain that 7 8 inch diameter. So don't sand inside the hole. But you can sand on the outside of it here, on the edge of the nutcracker, the top of it. And I like to just kind of work that edge back so it's nice and smooth. We don't want any sharp edges. And then the inside, same thing. A little bit of walnut oil, get your paper good and saturated. And then I work, try to work kind of in a circular motion like this so that I'm sanding with the grain. Just take a little extra time, try to get it as smooth as possible. Sand with the grain, sand around the edge of the opening with the grain if you can. Soften that line right there, that edge. You're going, people's going to be using this. You want it to be nice and comfortable to use. You don't want sharp edges. You don't want sharp corners. And then the back, I just kind of drag the sandpaper. It's kind of hard to get your fingers all the way back in there and sand back and forth like this. So I just kind of try to basically scrape it. <laughs> now, if you have a nice smooth surface from your scraper, which I did, I probably didn't even need to sand that in the back, but I just, I just do. I'm already in here, so... I figure why not. So just kind of check, take a paper towel, wipe your some of your oil off, check your work. All right, I know sanding is not, most people don't care to sand, but it makes or breaks your project in my opinion. You can be an average amateur turner as myself, but a good sanding job will really bring your work up to that next level, in my opinion. So we're ready to thread this hole here uh, for our threaded rod. I'm going to be using a 1 inch by 8 threads per inch beel spindle tap. Um, basically you use these to put threads and glue blocks so that you can thread them directly to the lathe. When I thread these, I like to saturate the inside of this with some walnut oil, which I already have, but I'm going to put just a little bit more in there. You want that nice and wet with oil there because that's going to help lubricate the spindle tap as it cuts the threads. And we put a little bit on the spindle tap too, just smear some on there. Okay, I have a paper towel down here on my bed just to catch any excess oil. And then the next step is you engage or you line up, there we are, there is a divot on the back of the spindle tap. And the point of the live center is going to engage in that and that's what's going to help us guide the tap in straight as we cut the threads. Now if you notice here on the very top or the very end I guess of the tap there's a little bit a slight bit of a chamfer on this first row of cutting teeth. I went ahead and chamfered the hole here with my bowl gouge that kind of helps center and I mean in my experience it kind of helps center that tap in there a little better because you want to make sure this is a crucial step you want to make sure you get this started cutting straight. All right. You don't want your threaded rod to go in crooked. It's not going to work. So we're going to take our time here. Okay, so we're going to 
engage that divot in the live center. I'm going to pull my tailstock up, but I'm not going to come all the way in yet. I'm going to advance my quill and I'm going to slowly uh, I'm trying to line this up as I'm going. So I want to turn this and I just want to make sure there or in there pretty straight and you'll be able to tell because it looks even. You can put a little force on that and back up your live center and the divot when you spin this by hand should stay pretty well centered. But we want to make sure don't try to cut these threads without the tailstock support. All right. So we're going to lock the spindle. We're going to turn this here with a wrench and as we're turning it with a wrench we're going to advance the quill slowly. You want to keep support against this because you want to guide this in as straight as possible. This is the make or break time right now. You want to make sure this threads as straight as possible. So we're going to lock our spindle. If your lathe doesn't have a spindle lock you could either uh, either ha have somebody hold the headstock spindle with a wrench, keep it from turning, or you could possibly, uh, you know, use some kind of clamp or other method to keep your headstock from turning. If you do that, unplug the lathe. We, you know, you don't want to take a risk of it turning on by accident. And saying as much, I am going to go ahead and unplug mine. So unplug your lathe, lock your spindle, or some other way. Some other way to lock the spindle, either use a spindle lock or the indexing feature on your lathe, whatever you have to keep this from turning. You only want the spindle tap and the live center turning. All right, so I just use one of these adjustable crescent wrenches, just anything that's going to fit securely. This is just four flats on the back of the spindle tap. So I don't really know what size wrench it takes, probably, I don't know, maybe half inch, maybe 9 16 somewhere in there. But use the, your tap might be different, it might even have handles, whatever. Um, just use what you, whatever you can to turn this. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to start slowly, turn a little bit, I'm going to feed my quill. Because as you turn this, it starts threading in and it moves away from the tailstock. So you want to try to keep even pressure. So as you're turning, feed the tailstock forward to keep this guided straight. Now generally when you're tapping wood or metal, you want to back the tap out occasionally and clear the chips. That's in my, in my experience, taking this all the way out is not a good idea. Once you get the thread started cutting, the best thing to do is just kind of take a little pressure off and back it maybe a quarter of a turn, eighth of a turn, somewhere near, and then go back forward again. Same thing. But try to keep steady pressure on the tail stock. So take your time. Not in a rush here. So just kind of go, go half a turn, back up a little bit, and then just keep going. It really doesn't take that long to thread these. If you start feeling a lot of resistance, stop, back your tap out, half a turn, see if maybe you've got some chips in there. But generally, with this spindle tap, I don't have any problems with it binding. It's got some pretty deep flutes in there that allows the chips to exit without me having to completely back the tap out. So. We're getting close to the end. Now what I like to do is I like to come on this side, see where I'm at. I'm just about through. So we're just going to keep going like we are. All right, and I've reached the end of my quill here, so I'm going to unlock my tail stock. I'm going to, by this point, the tap's in there nice and straight. It's not going anywhere if I remove the tail stock. All right, there we go. That should get us the rest of the way there. So we just continue what we were doing.
that clacking sound you're hearing when I'm backing out is my spindle lock. It's not very tight on this lathe. So, all right. We're all the way through. We don't have any more resistance. So we can start backing this out. Now you want to do this slowly too. Take your time. When you get towards the end where your tap is going to come out, don't let it kick to one side or the other. Try to take it out as straight as possible. You don't want to mangle the, the threads at the beginning of this. So just gently, slowly take it out. Try to keep it supported. There we go. We have our shavings inside here. Undo the spindle lock. Dump that out. All right. Now what I like to do, I like to take a toothbrush or some other small brush. And I like to clean these threads out. All right. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of hard to pick this up uh, at that angle, but you should be able to see the threads in there that we cut. So I like to clean that out, and then what I like to do is I like to go back. I like to chase my threads again with a tap. Put some walnut oil on it there. Some walnut oil around those threads. You want to make sure you lubricate this really well anytime you're running a tap through here. Even if you've already got threads cut, go ahead and lubricate it again. So I won't hurt anything. All right, so I'm going to bring my tap in again. I'm going to lock my spindle first. I'm going to bring my tap in here. Alright. I'm just going to back my quill up. I'm going to make sure I have plenty of extension here. Alright, we're going to... Okay, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to lock my tailstock down. And I'm going to just try to... And we're already kind of centered there. Cutting the threads again. Actually, we're chasing the threads this time. And see they're already cut so we can kind of get started by hand all right I'm getting a little resistance I'm just going to slowly and you want to continually feed you don't want to put a bunch of pressure on this all right what I'm doing here is as I'm turning this is going into the nutcracker I have to continually feed my quill to maintain support on the back of this tap. So you don't have to crank it down. We're not we're not holding something between centers. We're just guiding this in. So light pressure, but enough to keep the live center engaged in that divot. And I'm just going to run this through again. Once it gets in so far, it's self-supporting. And we can probably take the tail suck out of the way. And yeah, it's able to run it in by hand. Okay. So run that through like that. You don't have to go all the way, just as long as you get past your threads. So you've chased all your threads. And you'll notice you'll get some more shavings. And that's just mostly where when you originally went through, there's still some shavings in between those threads. So we're going to get those out of there. And you could chase these again if you want. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I just like to clean the threads out really well. When we cut our threaded rod, I generally put a little beeswax on it. And that keeps the threads from getting galled as it's used. Okay, so I don't know how well you can see those threads in there, but they're nice and clean. There's virtually no tear out on the, on the edges of the threads. So we got nice clean cut threads there. And that's the reason you want to use face grain. You're going to get nice clean threads. If we just went through the nutcracker blank, just through the end grain, we would have uh, ragged threads, there'd be some breakout in there, 
just because that's the nature of trying to thread in grain. So it's worth turning the face grain plug and taking the time because this is the end result. You get very nice clean threads that can be used over and over and over again and will wear for a very long time. All right, so our next step is to turn the cap for our nutcracker. This is a piece of Gonco Alves. Uh, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly. But I'm going to find centers on this, and then I'm going to mount it between centers on my lathe using a step drive here in the headstock. And I'm going to turn a tenon so that I can mount it in a chuck. Once it's in the chuck, I'm going to start shaping it, and I'm going to start turning the underside of the cap. It's going to have a slightly concave shape. And then I'm going to drill a hole, the same size hole that we drilled in the nutcracker for the threaded rod, and I'm going to thread this. And the reason for that is so that it'll hold the threaded rod nice and tight. A little bit of glue, twist it in tight, it's never going to come out. The other reason is so that I can reverse it again and just screw it directly on to my lathe spindle here. And then that way I can continue shaping, finish turning it, sanding it all while it's mounted here. All right, so let's get started with that. All right, so basically all I did, I faced this off. I concaved it in a little bit, about a quarter of an inch difference between the center and the outer diameter here as far as how much it's dished in. Um, you could undercut it more if you want, but keep in mind we're gonna be doming this out, uh, or rather doming the top to give it that cap look. So you don't wanna dish out too much material. We're not making a bowl. We just wanna give it that nice mushroom cap look. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, drill my hole.
All right, so I just finished wet sanding this with walnut oil. I sanded it up to 600 grit. I have my lathe set at about 225 RPMs, which is the lowest it'll go. I started with 150. I would sand with the lathe running at 150 grit. I'd stop the lathe, and then I'd take the 150, and I'd sand with the grain. Okay, so with this being a face turning, the grain's running this way. So you want to follow that grain as you're sanding it by hand. So sand with one grit, get your tool marks out, get any little nicks, gouges, whatever, get them out, stop the lathe, come back with the same piece of sandpaper and sand with the grit across this way. And do that for each grit, working up to 600. All right, so that's done. We're going to cut the threaded rod next. All right, so the nutcracker body has been turned, sanded, it's ready to go. Our cap has been turned and sanded, it's ready to go. Our next step is to cut the threaded rod that's actually going to crack the nut. So what I like to do is, is I just go ahead and thread the nutcracker onto the threaded rod here. This is also a good opportunity to uh, make sure your threads and stuff are, are good. And that it threads without any binds or anything like that. I got good thread here. Really good thread. Alright, so what I like to do is I like to spin this on. And I like to screw the rod down in until... You don't want to bottom out because you're going to tear up your nice surface in there. So I like to turn it in until it's about, I don't know if I can see that. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. I like to turn that down in until it's about an eighth or so away from the bottom. Um, it doesn't need to bottom out because this is only for when it's uh, caps tightened all the way down. You just want to make sure that it's not going to hit the wood down there and tear it up. So I like to spin it in. Give yourself some clearance there. And uh, then what I do is I take a marker. And I don't want to get it on my nutcracker, so I go a thread above, above the top here, and I make a mark with a permanent marker. All right. And then we can unthread the nutcracker. So there we go. So we got it. Just kind of check, make sure. I just want to make sure I didn't mark that in there with the rod. No, it looks good. Okay. So I have my I have my mark here. I have my mark here, and that's about a thread or two above the top of the nutcracker body. So then what I want to do is I am going to take my depth gauge here. I'm going to measure the depth of the hole that I drilled in my cap okay and I'm just shy of three quarters of an inch so probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to add probably about three quarters of an inch to this measurement if you want to air in cutting these air to cut them a little longer because you can always grind the end down or cut the end off um, if it's too long if you cut it too short, you risk the thread, uh, threaded rod not coming down in far enough to completely crack the nut. So just take your time, thread the nutcracker on, get a measurement, measure the depth of your cap, the hole in your cap here, and then add that to the overall length. So then I'm just going to move my depth gauge three quarters of an inch past that last thread, and then right there between those two threads, where the depth gauge lands is where I'm going to mark, and that's where I'm going to cut between those two threads. Now I'm going to use a reciprocating saw with a metal cutting blade, and then I'm going to take it to my belt grinder, and I'm going to flatten the ends of this, and one end I'm going to chamfer at an angle just to give it a nice smooth transition, and that's what will uh, be the end of the rod that actually cracks the nuts. So this just goes to show nobody's perfect. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how I got. I got about an extra... 3 8 or so rod here that I don't need. So uh, this is a good thing to do. You can test fit your rod after you cut it. 
make sure it uh, is a proper length. You can always cut more off or grind more off if you need to, but uh, it's better to leave them a little long than it is to leave it too short. All right, so I'm going to cut that back, test fit it a couple more times, and then we're going to come back and we're going to grind the ends flat on the uh, belt grinder here. All right, so I cut about three-eighths of an inch off of that rod. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. I got good clearance there. Still close enough that it's going to crack pretty much any nut, but um, you don't have to worry about it digging into the wood. The cap's fully seated, so there's no problems there. The next step, I'm going to take this apart, and I'm going to grind and chamfer this in so it's nice and smooth. And then once that's done, we would glue it into the cap. I'm not going to do that in this video. The oil on this still needs to cure. I still need to buff it up. So I will show a different nutcracker that I made in a similar style um, in use so that you can see that this uh, design actually does work. So I'm going to take this out and grind that off. Uh, what I like to do before I even put the rod in the nutcracker, even test fitting it, I like to clean it really well with denatured alcohol because sometimes there's a little bit of oil in these from where they are manufactured and I like to clean that all off completely. And then once everything's said and done, the threads, or the, I'm sorry, the rods glued into the cap, I will put uh, beeswax on this, make sure it's completely coated in beeswax, the bottom and everything. That helps prevent rust, but it also uh, allows it to move in the threads easily. All right, so let's get finished up. Okay, so here's the nutcracker completed. I don't have it buffed yet. I'm going to let the oil cure up for a few days, um, and I'm, then I'll glue the uh, rod into the cap here. But this is how it looks when it's done. All right. And here's the first one I made. This is kind of a prototype to get the right uh, dimensions and everything. The rod on this is purple because these are 3D printed uh, threads. <laughs> I printed a uh, threaded hollow rod and then I put a uh, half inch piece of maple dowel in it to give it some strength. Um, I didn't know how well the 3D printed threads would hold up over time, but so far it's been working just fine. So you see it cracks nuts. I'll put another one in here. And the metal uh, threaded rod works even better. But so here we are. A nice display piece that's also functional. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, I hope you consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching and have a great day.